Hello, Frank. Uh, a lot's been happening in the last few days. Um, Bin Laden's diaries. Uh, yes, Bin Laden diaries. Yes. <laughs> fugitives in China. Uh, yes. The Philadelphia School District yes. organization. Yes. Um, and I'm sure we can think of a few other things, but um, what comes to my mind as I try to make sense of all this and put it all together in a uh, a global dimension is that they all have, they're all things that have to do with organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the, uh, we're going through a phase of globalization now, which as you know, I like to call the crucial phase. And, and, but if you ask me what the crucial phase is, it's not so easy to say exactly why I'm calling it that, but mm -hmm. really it's because it's, um, it's a crisis of organization because all of our organizational forms are failing to deal with the problems that are now cropping up more and more from day to day. Um, because we, uh, everything has developed over in the 20th century in particular, more so probably even than previous centuries, as top-down organization. Mm -hmm. And now all the movement is bottom-up. Well, it, it's interesting. I went to parochial schools as a uh, as a young uh, child, and one of the things the nun always the nuns always told us was that if you ever said anything bad about anybody, it was akin to going up to the roof of the school with a pillowcase. This was back when they were made of goose feathers, and ripping the pillowcase open, and all the feathers would be blown by the winds to all parts of the town. You'd never be able to track back the ramifications of your words. And I can't help but think, when you talk about the uh, top-down uh, kind of organization, that I, in my mind, the most glaring example of, of such an organization right now is the government of China, all right, which is, is desperately, like the little Dutch boy in the dike, trying to stop whatever it needs to do, Chinese equivalent of Google, uh, Chinese equivalent of Twitter, uh, the U.S. versions of both, uh, cracking down on Chinese samizdat, uh, Etc. But nevertheless, this this amazing escape that seems to have taken place, that required organization and communication between many, many, many people to get this dissident out of his home, and then shepherd him safely 300 miles to Beijing, and then hide him for five successive nights in a row away from the authorities. It's it's pretty impressive stuff, given that kind of uh, force arrayed against it. It, it really is amazing. Um, and China, you're right, is the, probably the supreme example of the sort of thing that I've been thinking about uh, because it's the largest example of top-down organization anywhere. And it's been clear for some years now uh, that um, the, the bottom-up movements are getting more and more difficult for the government to deal with. And this uh, uh, latest episode of a single individual who's even blind mm -hmm. managing to apparently um, uh, maneuver himself in such a way that he calls into question all the top-down authority and even um, involves another big top-down authority, which is the United States. United States. Right. <laughs> and right. and, and the, the government of China and the government of the United States have no idea how to deal with each other mm -hmm. this because the, if somebody turns up in your embassy, then um, they're on foreign territory and uh, they, 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 there have to be rules for mm -hmm. what you do about it and the mm -hmm. rules aren't agreed on by both sides. Mm -hmm. This leads to another, another question. It's, it's useful for me because of my, my lack of experience compared to you when looking at this uh, problem of, of global institutions and their inadequacies. To, to try to look at it on a smaller scale, in this case, small being the government of China, it's hardly small, but to look at it at, at that level and, and try to see where the, where the seams are and where the potential cracks might be. And I'm also thinking of uh, uh, the uh, Bo, uh, Bode Lijai uh, situation two weeks ago. And I think I noticed a quote in The Economist, or it may have been The New York Times, in which it quoted a, uh, an average person saying, we sort of have a deal here where the corruption doesn't get too out of hand, or at least we can't see it, and our standard of living is maintained and gradually increases. So it strikes me that 
when the corruption got so out of hand and might even extend to include murder on, on Bo's part or his wife's part, it strikes me now uh, whether or not, in fact, that is, is that the quote-unquote deal that these institutions globally have with us? Is we'll make sure that your physical quality of life is acceptable and that you have a certain amount of freedom or at least freedom in your own mind but meanwhile, leave the driving to us. Well, I think that the, the, the bow problem in China is um, that uh, it, it's all focused on what's going to happen in the fall. And the political competition, which after all, in a sense, is democratic within the party. Yes, within a small group. Yes. Uh, uh, for, for who's going to get where in the party structure in the fall. Um, and uh, then... Um, there, there was also then conflict broke out within uh, Bo's structure in Chongqing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that got so bad that the person who was uh, a victim fled to the American consulate. Right, right. Why don't they go to the French or British consulate? <laughs> um. Well, everybody thinks that the Americans do what the British tell them to do anyway in, uh, in Asia still. That's, that's true, perhaps, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so um, the... the uh, that was an ex um, gave an opportunity for the people who don't want Bo to succeed in September to get rid of him now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't think we would have heard anything about it. Mm -hmm. You're probably Death right. Of, of a British, uh, um, a useful British man there or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the the other thing is Europe. That uh, the top down organization in Europe is failing completely. Nobody's going to put up with austerity. Uh, the people who have to do, uh, put up with it more are putting up with it least. There's big demonstrations in Barcelona today. Uh, I, I've been focusing on this on my television show. All right, people have had it with austerity. The, the, <laughs> the voters, the voters are one at one after another rejecting the people that are forcing austerity on them. The, the, what happens on May sixth in France will be the fifth country now. And I, I can't help but think back to a, a weekend column in the New York Times written by Paul Krugman, who I believe won the Nobel Prize not so long ago. He's an economist at Princeton, basically pulling his hair out at the idiocy of this, def, of this austerity spending being practiced by the West. And that according to Keynesian economics and any other person who knows anything about economics, the only way out of this is to start spending. And it, it, it would be a crime if... Ten years from now, they start spending, and we look back at this and realize that it was simply the simple switching of a switch that began to bring the West out of this economic downturn. Uh, I'm so happy that at least one economist who's good enough to get a Nobel Prize understands that money is not real. Yes, that's his whole point. <laughs> but but uh, most uh, the the at least 50 percent of the public opinion in this country, which is uh, uh, may win the election in, uh, in November, uh, still believes that money is real and money has to govern everything. And it's that attitude which is causing the problem in Europe. Uh, they don't, they've got to see it as a social problem. Uh, well, I, th I think the European voters have begun to see it as just that way. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, the voters are ahead of the people in power for um, all the wrong reasons, but nevertheless, they're essentially right. That's the only way to solve the problem. Um, I'm looking at the economic uh, uh, manifestation as, as a possible uh, crack or a seam or a chink in the, in the global infrastructural uh, edifice. I, I'm just wondering, I, I, don't, I don't need to mean that I'm a, uh, an anarchist of sorts, but I don't see a change in the uh, institutions to be able to handle the new thinking unless the institutions themselves are are forced to. That's the problem. That the the institutions we have are, insofar as they're uh, strong working institutions, are institutions that have grown up over the last 200 years or more, uh, when the state of things was different. And um, the older they are, the more difficult it is to change them. Mm -hmm. Look at the problems we're having in England trying to work out what the upper chamber of the legislature should be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, it's 50 years now since we realized that the, upper, the House of Lords 
doesn't work anymore the way it was uh, worked from uh, the time that it became one of two um, houses of the legislature uh, up until the 20th century. Um, and we, we think we still need, we've, well, we have, we've got to have a Supreme Court even if we don't need a second chamber. And what are we going to do? We can't work it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a continuing problem, and no government wants to really spend its time on it. Well, I, I, I do think that that situation in China, because of the uh, constraints that the government puts on the citizens leaving the country, as well as new people coming into the country, it's almost as if they've, they've built a wall around the country. And that what they're doing is they're, they're inadvertently, perhaps, turning the heat up. Uh, and it's, come to, uh, it's gone already from a low boil to a boil. And I don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, it, it's, it's not a good situation. Well, since money is the measure of everything, um, uh, as distinct from the absolute, um, um, what should I say, it's, it doesn't have absolute value in itself, but it measures social relations. Mm -hmm. And our money is so uh, um, intertwined with Chinese money, mm -hmm. uh, if things over the next year change significantly in China, uh, it's going to have global significance, not only because of China's role in um, international affairs, but because of what it will do to the international monetary situation. Well, there's no doubt of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, the more I see this sort of thing happening in particular parts of the world that are entirely top-down, the more I think back to the situation in the uh, medieval period, when we had Islamic civilization from the um, uh, west coast of North Africa through into central China mm -hmm. and south into uh, close to the south southern tip of India, um, and no single central authority. It was a very light rain. And uh, yes. Ibn Battuta could travel from Morocco to the Maldive Islands and back up through India to China and cash letters of credit mm -hmm. wherever he went and it worked and he could even get jobs in different places mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, we did and that was managed and it's the only time in world history that this sort of thing has ever been managed that way uh, without a central political authority and I, I of, of course uh, but everybody agreed to Islamic law um, they all interpreted it differently, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, mm -hmm. that was what made, held it together. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether we're going to be able to develop an international system of law which will allow something similar to ha like that to, uh, that to happen in the future. Because, for instance, you look at the, the South China Sea now, which is another area where there's so much problem, where uh, the China, Vietnam, um, for the Philippines, and I can't, can't remember how many other <laughs> yeah. countries that border it, each think they own either all or part of it, mm -hmm. and they're squabbling about it all the time. And uh, meanwhile, the people who use it are somehow managing to continue to use it, but every now and then the governments interfere. Um, Presumably, uh, we've got to somehow work out how to move into a system where the uh, local people can manage things, but the system according to which things are managed is internationally recognized and um, common enough for people to be able to move from one part of the world to another. I think part of the, part of the key to achieving such a thing is the very word that you're using, that word to manage. Right? Yeah. Not, not to uh, put a, a stamp of uh, uniformity or conformity onto the whole process, but simply to allow different groups, uh, different religious sects, different cultures, different languages uh, to be able to live in peace and practice whatever it is they're doing, uh, so long as they do no harm to the collective whole. And I, certainly in this country, I mean, there's a whole litany of, of people who have been publicly cited as saying that we do not do that as a, as a government or as a, as a culture. Uh, certainly beginning with the Uyghurs and God knows who else in China, there'd be a number of people who say that the Chinese don't do that. I could go back to the Romani uh, gypsies throughout Europe who would say that the Europeans don't do that. Um, I think is a lot of this is predicated on a kind of tolerance 
that uh, the Abbasids and the success of caliphates actually had that I, I don't really see replicated even after uh, 1,500 or so years. I don't think they were any more tolerant than, than we are, but I, I think that they, their reach wasn't uh, uh, extended enough for them to control anything but a very small area. But this, I think, uh, uh, gives me an opportunity to uh, finish up with the Philadelphia School District. Okay. Where, with, which, and what's interesting about that example is that there's a lot of very competent people, eager, well-trained, um, do their job very well in the Philadelphia School District, but this district doesn't work mm -hmm. because it's totally centralized. It's a large district and, and it's easy to compare it with Chicago and a number of other places that, that all have somewhat different records but face similar problems. And uh, in order to make the, the district appear to work at the, uh, from the top down, which is the way it has to work at the moment because that's where its funding comes from, um, the people who are good at doing what they do uh, aren't allowed to get on with what they're doing because they have to serve the system as it's designed from the top. Is so I, I think that, that gradually the people who are at the bottom of these systems are going to get more and more, what should I say, uh, able to do what they do because of the, the uh, increasing weakness of the central authorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually something will um, begin to work on a larger scale that is locally centered rather than um, um, concentrated in, uh, in large regions, one center in large regions as it is at the moment. That's interesting because for many, many years before 1917, the Ottomans were of course referred to as the sick man of Europe, as those decentralized groups began in fact to do just what you said, to begin yeah. to exercise yeah. more respective control. Yeah. yeah very interesting. Okay, so who's the next sick man? Well, I I, I had put my money on China. So <laughs> I think it's too soon yet. Uh, it is. Soon. All right, Professor, thank you very thank much. You. Okay.